absolutely. You know, I guess part of it depends on the definition of worlds. Um, I always liked this. I used to love to read science fiction, and I still do. I love science fiction. But I'd read about these things about there were parallel worlds, and you know, we could sometimes shift over into one world or the other. Um, that by our choices, we might follow certain paths. I love that sort of um, brain massage, you know, of like, wow, we could do that. But given the, my experiences and the experiences of others uh, that I know that are along the lines doing this work, yeah, we can shift over. Um, part of it is, I think, goes back to what I was saying earlier about remembering. You remember who we are. You know, we're not, yes, we are concrete, physical, um, in the flesh human beings, but there's two parts that humans and beings. You know, the human part maybe is the part that connects us or that, you know, this flesh is just as much spirit as something more ethereal, but there is something more ethereal that we can, we can transit and, and, and move into these other worlds. What I was describing earlier about the point uh, doing journeying after death, those are other worlds, a multitude of worlds. Um, being able to, uh, for instance, sometimes I'll do so-called animal spirit readings where somebody, I'll, I'll sense, feel, um, hear, or see maybe an animal spirit. And often that animal spirit which I believe is an ancestor really coming through in that animal form, in spirit form, um, will communicate something to me, either show me or say something in my head or I'll get a feeling. And I'd, I've had so many experiences like that, I have to go like into a certain space to do it, that I'm convinced, you know, what, how, how does that happen? I don't even think of how. I've certainly stopped asking why, you know, at this point for the most part. But how does that happen? I don't know, but I do know it happens. So one explanation would be that, that there, there are certainly alternate realities. Uh, anybody who lived through the 60s, you know, knows that there's alternate realities. That was one of the things about when LSD and all that stuff was introduced, you know, there was a lot of controversy and it became illegal. But what it did is it opened a window and opened a door, as Aldous Huxley's talked about, the doors of perception. My own belief is you don't need to uh, um, use... Uh, well, let's put it this way, there are some cultures that do use plant medicine, and I know Alberto, you know, uh, takes people down to the Amazon region and works with ayahuasca. Uh, there's peyote, there's um, uh, uh, mushrooms, but I think in the 60s we were using it to get high, you know, and I, I admit I did, you know, I, I experimented, unlike Bill Clinton, I inhaled, you know. <laughs> I experimented and it, it did open, but I didn't know what to do with it. There was no context, you know, to, to deal with it. Whereas with plant medicine that has a tradition of being used, there's, there's a context in which to work with it. Not having, I have not had the Amazon experience. I may or may not, you know, I may never and I may, I don't know. I, I'm not called to it at this point. But I know that when there's a context, when there's an understanding, something else happens when you um, indulge, if you will. It's not about getting high, and I think that I, I, I think it's tragic that there are, there are again younger people that are doing this, but they don't have a context for it. They're having fun, they're tripping, you know, tripping out. But you know, and also they get sometimes get into some pretty freaky stuff, and you know, they get real scared. They, but they don't have guidance, they don't have um, teachers, they don't have somebody there to monitor, to help, or as I understand from the ayahuasca, to sing. You know, to sing them, if you've done that, you know what I'm talking about. I don't, I haven't experienced it, but that's, that's a whole different way of working with plant medicine. Now, what also, though, I found is that um, using other means, and there's not all cultures that, not actually probably minor, minority cultures that use plant medicine, uh, a lot of other cultures, they use sound, rhythm, music, chanting, etc., to move into that zone where we can perceive the doors of perception open up without having to ingest anything. Don't get me wrong, I, I think people should, stupid drug logs, you know, that we have, I think they should be just dropped, you know, and go for treatment for people who misuse and abuse the drugs. And I don't, I wouldn't even call, for instance, uh, marijuana, I wouldn't call it a, a drug. It's a plant medicine. I wouldn't call ayahuasca a drug. It's a plant medicine. But again, it depends on context and how it's used. When it's used for inspiration and revelation, like ayahuasca or uh, mushrooms, again, depending on the context, then it's wonderful, wonderful information can be uh, perceived that otherwise might be a little bit harder to get through. Now, given that, I've also found that drumming and rattling, you know, again, do this for about 10 minutes with a drum. 
you're in a zone. I'm going to do a workshop just in a bit, and that's what we're going to do. Didgeridoo is another one. Didgeridoo is amazing. Puts you into that. Ooh, get chills. You know, things start happening with that, that sort of... And, and when it's used with intention, we can travel. Like I said, I, I, I expect to do more of these journeys after the point of death. I'm, I'm curious about it. Especially the closer I get to it. <laughs> much information as possible, please, before I go through that gate. You know, I'm going to find out. And as much, but it's not just information, it's information, you know, heart medicine. I think that m my way of thinking about it is if we have ways to experience that and then experience it again and again and again, then what happens is we have a reservoir of memory of what that's like. And after a certain amount of experiences, and I do underline that word experiences of it, not some intellectual didactic notion of what God is like or first source and center, but we have experiences of it, then it's a little easier to get to. Now, how do you get to it in the first place, though? Well, again, we mentioned plant medicine. That's one way. Uh, drumming, rattling. Uh, meditation is a great way to do it. Uh, anything. I, know, I remember doing, I did Tai Chi for about 10 years. And I love that so much more than the sit-down meditation. It just worked for me. But I remember going into that place where I was doing that movement and, and nothing else existed other than the movement was moving me, you know, as Ben said, or the dance was dancing me. Uh, the song was singing me. The more we do that, the easier it gets to, uh, the easier it is to get to that state. I don't think it's something other than some chosen mystics where that's their calling, to hang out there. I like Thich Nhat Hanh's statement, who's this the Buddhist monk that's a wonderful teacher about walking meditation. He said, it's not about walking on water. It's about walking on the earth. And that's the real art. Um, I remember a friend told me a great story. He said he was at a troubled time in his life. He went to a monastery. And, you know, he was talking to this monk who was very, very peaceful, you know, and very meditative. He did a lot of meditation. He's sitting there, he says, I was having this conversation with this guy. And I says, you know, and this is the man who's telling me the story about the monk. He says, I'm talking to this monk, and I'm saying, I said to him, bless you, thank you for doing the work that you're doing, you know. And I just honor you for doing this work. And, keep, and the monk said, oh, no, 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 no. It's I who honor you. I get to hang out here. You have to go back down into the world. Isn't that a great story? So the, the sweetness of that is that, yeah, I might have to go to the monastery once in a while, kind of refresh my memory, whatever way you go to the monastery, metaphorically, and then you take it out onto, into the world. That's the real challenge, you know. The kid starts screaming, you know, the guy cuts you off in the traffic, you know. But here's my take on it is I'll go there, I'll get pissed off or, you know, upset or, or whiny or whatever it may be. And most of those are, as Albert Ellis said, most of those are, uh, most neuroses are advanced. Uh, or he called them, he said, most neuroses are adult versions of whining and pouting. <laughs> I love that way of putting So, you know, I whine and pout just like, you know, even at 59 years old, just like anybody else can. But the, the catch is I don't stay there. You know, I want, it's not where I want to be. It serves a purpose. Uh, who's the one? Abraham. Uh, Jester, uh, Jerry and Esther Hicks. I think they're doing some fantastic teachings because it's very, very practical. It's that, yeah, you're not going to stay in that vibe all the time. Unless you are, you know, a special case, you know, a Buddha or, you know, somebody like that. But I ain't there. I don't expect that's not my path. But what you can do is you can, if you go into, say, the lower vibrations, not upper, higher, lower, better, worse, but, you know, lower vibrations, if you go there, there's a way to get back out there. You know, and they have some wonderful teachings about that, is to bring yourself back out. Human touch is a wonderful way. You know, that's one way. Get yourself grounded again and focused. Meditate. You know, I mean, there's a number of ways. <laughs>